Good to, it's really good to be back uh, with you this morning. Uh, we were away as a family for a few weeks with my mom and dad and some of her extended family. So we were with biological family um, and perhaps with my dad and maybe my mom, also spiritual family, but this is really our family. And it was so good to, to be back with you this morning and to be singing that first hymn, How Good It Is, When the Family of God Dwells Together in Unity. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to hear through the chat and even see this morning how many of our family are, are suffering in, in really bad ways. But it's good to gather together and to be strengthened together through singing, through the preaching of God's Word, through the reading of the Word, through prayer together. So I'm so glad uh, to be back with you and to have the opportunity to serve you again in the Word. If you'll take your Bibles, uh, turn to Luke chapter 14. I intended to speak this morning out of Ephesians, and indeed naturally read out of Ephesians, but as we heard about in the book of Esther, God reigns sovereign. And yesterday, a two-hour Bible study in Cahiso turned into five and a half hours. And so as I thought about preparation for this morning, I thought it would serve you better for me to speak from Luke 14 rather than what I intended in the, the letter to the Ephesians. So Luke chapter 14 we're going to be looking at verses 25 to 33. 25 to 33. Before we do that, let's pray together. Um, Lord Jesus, when we sing that last hymn, we do, we marvel at what you've done for us. Um, we cannot understand the depth of what you suffered in our place on the cross under the full weight of God's wrath. Um, but we believe that is what you experienced, that you bore our sins and you bore his wrath that we deserved in our place. And Father, we bless you that uh, you have exchanged um, Christ's robes for ours, that you robed him in our sin and that you have robed us who believe in him in his perfect righteousness, Lord. We thank you so much for welcoming us into your family through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we confess this morning uh, publicly that you are worthy of all that we are, all that we have. You're worthy of our highest love and devotion and obedience, and we want to give it to you. So we ask as we look at your words and listen to your words now that you would, by your spirit, uh, help unbelievers in our midst who have not yet committed to you to understand your conditions for being a disciple. And those of us who have committed to you, remind us of what it means to follow you and what you demand of those who follow you, for you are worthy and you alone of it. Would you do that, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. So Luke chapter 14, before we dive into the text, um, we're just in the middle of the Gospel of Luke, so it's good to know that uh, from chapter 9 in Luke's Gospel, Jesus begins his final journey to Jerusalem. So from chapter 9 through to, I believe, chapter 18 or chapter 20, Jesus is journeying on the road to Jerusalem. And this is the last time he's going to go to Jerusalem. Because this time, his life is going to, to end. He's already told his disciples multiple times that this time, when he comes to Jerusalem, he will suffer greatly and die. Listen to what he said to them in chapter 9. And Jesus strictly charged and commanded the disciples to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And then a few verses later, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. So as Jesus is on the road here in chapter 14, the cross, his crucifixion, is looming in front of him. And nevertheless, along the way, he continues to pause at times and to show mercy and pity to blind people and those who need his healing touch, performing divine miracles. And he continues to teach the people who gather around him and who are journeying with him along the way so that they might better understand the way of salvation and what it means to be one of his disciples. 
So it's no surprise at this point, we read in verse 25, look there, Luke tells us that great crowds were accompanying Jesus. Note, it's not just a great crowd, but great crowds, plural. Numerous crowds, mega crowds. Perhaps thousands of people are gathered around Jesus and traveling with him as he journeys in the direction of Jerusalem. Now surely, with a group this large at this stage, there were some in that group who at this point had truly believed in Jesus Christ. They really believed he was the Messiah. He was God's anointed king, and they had committed themselves to be his disciples and to follow him. But not everyone. Others in this large crowd surely had not yet believed in Jesus, had not yet committed themselves to be his disciples. Perhaps some were coming to Jesus because of the amazing miracles he was performing. Either they had seen him perform them, perhaps they had heard of his miracles and were hoping to see him do it. Maybe they were the beneficiaries of his healing power. And yet they had not yet committed to him as their Lord. Maybe others were following Jesus because of his incredible teaching. You remember what some of the, the Jewish soldiers or officers said when they were sent to arrest Jesus? They came back empty-handed to the Jewish council, and they said, why haven't you brought him? And they looked at the leaders and said, this man speaks as no man has ever spoken. He marveled people. They were astonished as he taught with inherent authority. Whatever reasons or reason it was, there were different kinds of people surrounding Jesus and following him. And I think it's safe to assume this morning, with a gathered congregation this large, it's the same in a sense. Now probably all of us, or most of us this morning, would profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, his disciples. And some of us have truly, genuinely committed our hearts and lives to him. But not all of us. Maybe some here this morning are just interested in Jesus, or interested in the Bible, or in Christianity, and present in the meeting this morning for a, a number of reasons. Maybe your parents raised you in a Christian home, brought you up in a church, Maybe a girlfriend or boyfriend is a Christian and you're just tagging along for the sake of the relationship. Maybe you're visiting this morning with your children or, or with a parent and for the sake of um, attachment to that family member, you thought it would be a nice thing to honor them and, and to go along with them to church. Maybe you've been going through some very difficult times recently and you thought, either I'll go back to church or try church and try Jesus and try Christianity again or for the first time in hoping that it will, will solve the problems and difficulties you've been going through. Maybe you come out of a very unhealthy church background and you've come to realize that the church you've been in is a false church and they've been fleecing you for your money and promising you false things and you're done with that and you're just looking for a healthy true church and you happen to be at Emmanuel this morning just checking it out. Maybe someone invited you, you came across it on the internet. Whatever the reason is or the reasons are, you're here this morning, but perhaps you've not yet fully committed yourself to follow Jesus Christ. If you were honest, you'd have to say, I know some things about Jesus. I've heard about him. Maybe I've read my Bible. I've taken a course. I've, I've studied some things. I grew up in church, but no, I'm honestly not yet a true disciple and follower of Jesus. It was this kind of a mixed crowd that was walking along with, accompanying Jesus, Luke tells us there in verse 25. Look again there at verse 25. Luke says, as this crowd was accompanying him, Jesus did something. Notice he says, Jesus turned around and said to them. This is very dramatic. You can picture it. Jesus is walking along with this crowd around him, and they're, they're moving at a certain pace for a certain time, and all of the sudden... Jesus stops walking and turns around now and puts himself either in a position or just turns at the head of the pack 
And now he is facing the crowd, perhaps as I'm facing you here this morning. And he addresses them now. He looks them in the eyes and addresses them as this mixed crowd and says these words, starting in verse 26. Let me read them for you. Listen to Christ's words to the crowd and to us here this morning. Verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him and say, this man began to build, but was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if he is not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. If you weren't aware before this morning, I trust now you're aware from what I've just read that there are terms and conditions to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We commonly call them for short T's and C's. You know what I mean by T's and C's, terms and conditions. Your phone vibrates in your pocket. It dings over on the table, so you go and pick it up, and your screen shows that you've got a new, a new message, a new SMS. So you swipe the screen down to read it, and these words pop up. Congratulations. You qualify for 50,000 Rand funeral cover plus grocery benefits and more. SMS funeral to 12345, whatever the number is, right? You've gotten those messages I have. <laughs> and you think... Wow, perhaps you think, this is amazing. I can't believe I can get all this. Can, can this really be? And so, as your eyes glance down, though, the message isn't completely over. You see right at the bottom these final letters and words. T's and C's apply. Right? There's, there's terms and conditions that apply to the offer. In order for you to, to get the offer, to benefit from it and the coverage, you have to agree to certain terms, and you have to meet certain conditions. So you click the link provided in the SMS, and it takes you to another page where you read the, the T's and C's. And there you learn that every year your premiums may or will increase, but your amount of cover will not. If at any time you stop your monthly premium payments, your policy will be immediately canceled, and you will not be reimbursed what you've already invested into the policy. Also, you have to submit a six-month waiting period. Then you read that you can't be more than 65 years old. You have to undergo certain medical tests to make sure you haven't been diagnosed with anything that's going to kill you in a few months. You get the idea. These are the, the terms and conditions, the T's and C's. You have to be willing to agree to the terms, and you have to meet the conditions. If you don't, then you do not qualify for the offer. You cannot take out a funeral cover plan with this company. In a similar way here, I believe we have Jesus' T's and C's, his terms and conditions for being his disciple. He's telling us what we must know and agree to if we're going to follow him into the kingdom of God and eternal life. And he gives us, I believe, three conditions in these verses. Let me just say at the outset, as we work through these conditions, um, I, I believe we're going to work through one of them today, and then maybe at another point uh, I'll speak again, God willing, and, and look at the other two. So if you don't think I'm making quick enough progress through the first, just, just be at ease. We'll just cut it and come back for the, the last two. 
But uh, before we look at them, I just want to say to unbelievers here, those who have not yet committed their lives to Jesus Christ, if you've ever wondered, or if you're wondering this morning, what must I do? What must I be willing to do? What does Christ require of me? What demands does Jesus make upon his people, those who are his disciples and followers? Christ will answer that question for you this morning, okay? So I, I trust these words will be instructive in letting you know right up front what it is you must be willing to do in order to follow Jesus and have eternal life. And then for those of us who, who have committed sincerely to Jesus Christ, um, these words may serve in multiple ways. They may be a reminder. Sometimes we can forget the high calling to which Christ has called us as his people, the high cost to which he has called us in following him. And being reminded of that, that cost and the extent of what we must be willing to do in following him may serve as a rebuke for some of us and may serve as an encouragement to others of us. But I trust the Spirit of Christ will apply it to us in whatever way we need this morning. Okay? So three conditions. Before we look at them in turn, I want to first ask a few introductory questions to better understand the nature and importance of these conditions. First introductory question. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Generally, the word disciple means a learner or a student and a follower. So it's a learner and a follower. So in reference to Jesus, a disciple is one who sits under and learns the teachings of Jesus Christ that are found here in the New Testament and then submits his or her life to the teachings of Jesus Christ. A disciple is someone who confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and they join themselves to his party. They become a follower of his beliefs, confident that what he speaks is true, but also committed to seeking to apply his teachings consistently to their life. Being a disciple of Jesus is not just about learning about Jesus, just having more information. It's not even just learning what Jesus commands his people, but it's being a doer of the commands of Jesus Christ. Remember in the Great Commission, Jesus told the apostles, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Not just know, but do. Keep, obey, observe the commandments of Christ. So becoming a disciple of Jesus really is a way of talking about conversion. It involves repentance, turning away from, from living as our own lords and masters, and putting ourselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it involves faith trusting Jesus as he leads us in daily life. Second question, why is it so important to become a disciple of Jesus? You might ask, what's the big deal? Why do I have to become a disciple of Jesus? And the answer is this, it's important because only those who are disciples of Jesus those who believe in and live by the words of Jesus, only those will escape the coming judgment of God and enter his kingdom for eternal life. Eternity is at stake. Just look with me for a moment back in Luke chapter 6. At the end of Luke chapter 6, Jesus is speaking here. And in verse 46, he says these words. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and what? Does them. Do you see that there? And does them. I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house, but could not shake it, 
because it had been well built upon the rock. But the one who hears and does not do them, notice, hears and does not do them, is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, the house immediately fell, and the ruin of that house was great. You see what Jesus is alluding to. Final judgment. Those who will be able to stand in God's final judgment and those who will be destroyed by it. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, if you do not believe in and live by the words of Christ, if you do not follow him as the Lord of your life, Jesus says you will come under the everlasting judgment of God and perish in your sins. But if you seek to build your life upon the teachings of Jesus, then you will stand in the day of judgment and enter the coming kingdom of God. And let me be clear, not because eternal life is some sort of payment from God in return for how well you lived, as though you will be granted eternal life based on your works and religious efforts. It's not what is being said here. But the person who builds their life upon Jesus Christ, not perfectly, but consistently and sincerely, demonstrates by that life of obedience that they have trusted him and embraced Jesus as their Savior and King. And it is only those who have done that that will enter the kingdom of God when Christ returns. That is why it is important to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Third, looking more again at these conditions, turn back to chapter 14. Thinking about the conditions now themselves, we might ask, to whom do these conditions apply? To whom do these conditions apply? Sometimes companies may make offers to people, and not everyone who applies for this or that policy or this or that offer is subjected to the same terms and conditions. They may have different terms and conditions for different applicants. What about the conditions of Christ here? To whom do his conditions apply? Well, Jesus' conditions here are universal. They're universal. They apply to all people without exception. Notice there in verse 26, the way Jesus presents these conditions. He says, if, notice, anyone, if anyone comes to me and does not, and then again, look at verse 27. Whoever does not. See again, whoever. And then in verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not. His language is consistently universal. It applies to all people and to every single individual. If anyone, whoever, any one of you, every single individual person, whether man or woman, boy or girl, single, married, divorced, remarried, widowed, whether white or black or brown or yellow, whether you speak English, Afrikaans, Dutch, French, Sizulu, Setswana, whether you grew up in a secular home or a Christian home, whether you go to church, read your Bible, pray, if you've been baptized, if you tell others about Jesus, or if you do none of those, Whoever you are, wherever you live, wherever you come from, whoever your parents are, whatever your level of education is, whatever, your, whatever job you have, however much money you have, whatever your position is in community, whatever your past has been, whatever your present is, it does not matter. Doesn't matter. Jesus' terms and conditions for being his disciple apply to each and every one of us here this morning. No exceptions. No exclusions. Therefore, every single one of us needs to listen carefully to these conditions that Jesus gives. And we need to seriously consider his words and examine ourselves to see if we have been committing to him the way he asks us to. Fourth, final introductory question. How rigid are Jesus's conditions. How rigid are they? Christ's conditions here are absolute. 
They are totally absolute. If you do not agree to the terms that Jesus gives us here, if you do not meet these conditions, you cannot be his disciple. It's that simple. Notice again each of the conditions, the way they end. Look at verse 26. If anyone comes to me, Jesus says, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, notice what he says, he cannot be my disciple. Notice again in verse 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, what? Cannot be my disciple. In verse 33, therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Three times, cannot, cannot, cannot be my disciple. Jesus could not be more emphatic. He could not be more direct and plain and absolute. He does not say, if you don't meet these conditions, you might be able to be my disciple. Or you could be, but a less committed disciple. You know how some people make a distinction? It's an unbiblical distinction. And they'll talk about spiritual and, and carnal Christians. You know, spiritual ones are those who have truly committed to be disciples of Jesus. And, and those who haven't, well, they still have eternal life, but they're just not disciples of Jesus. No, no, there's, there's no second group in following Jesus. You're either a disciple or you're not. You're either in or you're out. You're either following or you, you aren't. These conditions are absolute. Literally, the language here Jesus is saying is, it is impossible for you to be a disciple of Jesus if you will not meet these conditions. If we do not meet the conditions that Christ gives us here, we cannot be his disciple, which means we cannot have eternal life, which means we will not enter the coming kingdom of God. You see how important it is to understand and consider and ensure that we're meeting these conditions that Christ calls us to as his disciples. So with that said, let's look at the first condition of being a disciple of Jesus. First condition is this. Christ says if we're going to be his disciple, we must change our relational priorities. We must change our relational priorities. Look at verse 26. Again, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. These are shocking words. They're very strong words. Jesus says, if you want to be his disciple and follow him, you must hate your family. Now, is Jesus saying that we should utterly detest and resent our closest family members? That we should wish evil upon them? Withhold our affections from them? Refuse to help them in times of need? Be rude and disrespectful to them? And even seek to inflict harm upon them? No, that is not what Christ means here. Well, then what, what does he mean? I believe what he means is that we should prioritize our relationship with him over all our earthly relationships, even our closest and most precious ones. We should love Jesus supremely more than we love our very own flesh and blood family members. Why do I interpret Jesus' words here in that way? Because of what he said in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said these words in a very similar vein to his disciples. He said in verse 34, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now when you first hear that, you ought to stop and shake your head and say, what? 
Didn't the angels say when Jesus was born, peace on earth and goodwill toward men? This is the prince of peace. He's the incarnation of peace. He's divine peace in human flesh. What do you mean, Jesus, you didn't come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword? Well, he explains. He says, for, here's what I mean, I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. You see what he's saying? Christ is saying, I will divide families. I will even divide marriages. Husbands and wives who have the most intimate earthly union is one flesh. Some will be divided over me. Over how they think about me. Over how they feel about me. Over how they relate to me. How they relate to me the level of their commitment and devotion and affection to me will determine whether they will be able to have peace among themselves or they will be divided over me. We know that because in the next verse he says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. When Jesus says we must be willing to, to hate our closest family mem members, what he's requiring of us is that we must be willing to love him and be devoted to him above every other person in this world and in our lives, even those that are most close to us. I believe what he's saying in essence is, if our relationship to our father, to our mother, to our wives, to our husbands, if our devotion to a brother or a sister, to a son or a daughter, to uncles or aunties, to grandparents, if our relationship with a neighbor or a boss or a colleague or a friend or a classmate, if any of those relationships come into conflict, this is the issue, bottom line, if any of those relationships come into conflict with our relationship with Jesus, we must choose Jesus over that person and be devoted to Christ above that person. We must be willing to cling to Christ and hold on to the relationship we have with him and our commitment to him over that relationship and that individual. For example, if an extended family member tries to give you what they think is wise counsel and says, you know, you ought to live with that person you've been dating. In fact, you ought to sleep together. Because after all, you, you don't know if you're physically compatible and you'd hate to get married to the person and find out later that you actually weren't and, and then there's no reason to stay in the marriage. So in order to save you both that grief, why don't you just, just try it out physically first and then make a decision on who you want to marry based on that. But you know as a disciple of Jesus that Christ says, do not commit sexual immorality. You see, now you're faced with a choice. And in Christ says, and Christ says, we must regard Jesus' counsel and disregard the so-called advice of an extended family member. We must honor Christ and what he calls us to, and even dishonor a family member by rejecting their advice. If a friend says to you, Come on, let's party tonight. Let's go get drunk. But Jesus says, do not be drunk with wine. If a friend says to you, uh, send you a message with a link in it to access some sporting event or movie without having paid for it, you can imagine that's happening a lot now with the World Cup of Rugby if you don't have a certain subscription or something. And you know, hey, this is not right. This would be stealing, and Jesus says in Ephesians 4, stop stealing. You see, again, you're faced with a decision. Do you go along with your friend? Do you disobey Christ? Disobey his clear commands? Access the link in order to save face with a friend and keep that relationship? 
No, Christ says we must be willing to reject our friend's offer and invitation. Maybe even willing to, to lose that friendship. Because the most loving thing would be to not just say no thank you, but to point out to the person, you know, this actually isn't right to be stealing from the companies who have broadcast rights over this event, or the person who's produced this movie. And you might lose that friend, but you must be willing to keep your friendship with Jesus. Maybe a spouse, a husband, a wife says to you, yeah, it's okay if you want to keep meeting with those born-again Christians at Emmanuel. Maybe even attend their Bible study or their men's or women's small groups. But I do not want you, as a husband or a wife, I do not want you to join there as a member. And I forbid you from giving our money to that religious organization's. But you read in the New Testament where Jesus says, Submit yourselves to elders of a local church. Join yourself to my body. Give of your finances to support the leaders in the work of ministry in your local church. You need to, perhaps, rebel against a husband or wife in order to submit to the commands of King Jesus. If a mother or father says to you, My son, my daughter... It's okay if you want to attend that Baptist church, maybe even uh, participate in certain activities and events that they're doing, but I know it's a Baptist church, so don't you go getting any crazy ideas that you're going to go up front someday and they're going to immerse you down uh, in some water and baptize you and you're going to join that church. Don't forget, we had you baptized as an infant. Or you were baptized in our presence as an 8-year-old or a 15-year-old in the church that we raised you in. We have our own traditions. We have our own beliefs and convictions. We made our own covenants before God. We took vows together, and we will not allow you to renounce those in order to follow this new church and their teaching on, on baptism. But you read your New Testament, and it is so obviously clear and compelling that Christ says, repent and be baptized. Oh, how I wish translations would say, and be immersed. It's just what the word means. And swear public loyalty to me and allegiance to me in baptism. You must be willing to dishonor and repudiate your mother, your father, your old church, your old traditions in order to honor and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If a boss or coworker asks you to lie on some papers at work in order to make them look better on a report or in order to increase the revenue for the company, do some shady business deal to make them extra money, but Jesus says, do not lie, but speak the truth to your neighbor. You must be willing to obey and please Jesus and disobey your boss and offend your colleague even if that means it's going to be hell on earth for you with that colleague at work, or you may lose your job. Jesus requires that if we're going to be his disciples, we must be loyal to him more than anyone else. Please him above everyone else. Listen to him above everyone else. Honor him more than anyone else. Obey him above everyone else. We must love him and be devoted supremely to him and him alone. Otherwise, he says, you cannot be my disciple. And just the last word before I pray. Maybe as you've been hearing Jesus' words this morning and some of the more specific examples that I've put forth, maybe already the Spirit of God, especially for believers, is showing you perhaps a person, a relationship, in which you've been putting that person, that relationship, above Jesus. And you know, and this morning you're being reminded that you've been choosing to hold on to that person and honor that person and keep that relationship, and you've been walking in disobedience to your Lord Jesus Christ. If that's the case, do not reject or resist that conviction that the Spirit of God is working in you. Receive that this morning. That's, that's the love of Christ, that he loves you and cares for you enough to bring that to your mind 
and go to God in prayer and repent. Just repent of that. Turn from that. And like Abraham, as he offered up Isaac, be willing to lay all people, all relationships, again afresh, but perhaps this particular one, this, this darling, this, this bosom relationship, this Isaac, whom you love and, and whom you would hate to lose. And be willing. Maybe that means a hard conversation you need to have with someone. Maybe you need to confront someone in sin. Maybe it's a believer. Maybe it's an unbeliever you need to talk to about their sin and their need for Christ. Whatever it is, maybe you need to come clean about something to someone and, and then talk to them about the issue in their life. Whatever Christ is calling you to in relationship to someone else, and you've known it, but you've, you've not been obedient to it, you need to repent and obey Jesus. Renew your commitment to him as, as being your supreme Lord and having supreme devotion in first place among, above, all other relationships and people in your life. Okay? And as I said earlier, for some of us, this should not just be a word of rebuke or correction, but a word of encouragement. Some of you know what it is, either in the past or presently, to be paying a cost relationally for following Jesus. Okay? Perhaps it's cost you very close relationships, even to this day, with family members, even believing family members over a sharp disagreement over something, and you believed it was, you were bound in your conscience to follow Jesus on this or that issue. You've paid, you've paid a cost, or you're paying a cost. Maybe you get around your unbelieving family sometimes, even those who profess faith in Christ, come out of a Christian religious background, and they just think you are an absolute fanatic. And they're just constantly reminding you, pump the brakes, pump the brakes, calm down, slow down, especially the older ones. Slow down, young man. You're, you're an enthusiast. You're a fanatic. Jesus isn't calling you to that level of commitment. He doesn't call us to, to that level of commitment. Be encouraged this morning. Christ calls you to an even higher level of commitment than you're living to at this moment. But you're on the right path. You know, sometimes when we have people around us, even well-meaning people, sometimes even in the church, who, who try to sort of slow us down and calm us down and, and uh, say, maybe Christ really isn't calling you to, to do this or that or lose this or that relationship. And, you know, you can start to wonder, am I being overly zealous? Do I really have to uh, go this far in obeying Jesus and be willing to lose this relationship, especially a close family member, someone I'm around constantly? Be encouraged. If you're following Christ's clear commands for your life, you're on the right path. And Christ promised that there was going to be a cost to following him. This is what he calls us to as his disciples. Okay. So may Christ get what he's worthy of in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would do that by your spirit. We need you to grant us a godly repentance and sorrow where we've been failing to be devoted to you and honor you supremely in our relational priorities, in, in our relationships with other people. If you haven't already, would you, as we reflect on these words in the coming days, would you show us where you desire us to repent and to be willing to sacrifice and risk relationships out of a supreme devotion and loyalty to obeying and following your will for our lives. Help us to trust you. We need your grace to help us to trust you. Thank you that you died and bled for us on the cross and that you rose from the dead. Thank you that our imperfect devotion to you and, and the times at which we fail to put you first have been fully paid for through your death on the cross. Thank you that we are forgiven who trust in you. And thank you that you've put your spirit within us to lead and guide us into full, consistent obedience and commitment to you. And again, Lord, we pray for those in our midst who do not yet trust you, are not fully committed to you. Perhaps the main reason this is so is because there is a relationship with an individual that is standing in their way. Would you smash that down, Lord? Would you show them that if they cling to that relationship and to that person, they cannot be your disciple. They will not inherit eternal life. 
show them that no person, no relationship, is worthy of perishing in their sins and receiving the never-ending wrath and judgment of God forever. Show them how worthy you are to forsake all people and all relationships, to have you and to have eternal life as your disciple. Would you do that, we pray, that you would get the glory that you alone are worthy of. Father, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.